Johnny and James. They are easily led. Welcome to Easily Led, the miniature wargaming podcast that condones you having more miniatures than you'll ever need. I'm Johnny from Johnny Watson Gaming, and I am joined with James from Scruffy Crow. James, how are you doing? I'll survive. Uh, glad to be here. Good, good. So, James, what have we got for the show today? Um, well, as ever, we'll start with a little bit of current events. Uh, so I'll have a chat about my recent visit to the Selwig uh, game show. And then we, our main topic for today is going to be all about complexity and games and are games too simple nowadays or is that being an old fuddy-duddy? Uh, and I think that could be a fairly interesting conversation. Yeah, definitely. And then we'll end on a recommendation like usual. Perfect. Right then, James. So how did your little trip to the convention go? Yeah, well, I said, well, I said at the beginning of this year, that I wanted to go to more of these sort of smaller wargaming shows. Because I've been going yeah. to Salute now every year for, what, five or six years? Yep. Uh, something like that. And I really enjoy Salute. It's probably one of my favourite days of the whole year. Yeah, it's a good day. It is a good day. Uh, and I'm looking forward to this one in a, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, me too, me too. And so, yeah, someone I know mentioned that this one was on uh, and it was uh, coming up. And they were. It was Matt Biggs actually from the uh, from Mini War footage, uh, and he was going to be running a Stargrave game. Unfortunately, he had to pull out. Um, but I'd already been sort of put onto the idea this was on, and I thought, well, I'm not doing anything else that day, so I'll uh, pop down and take a look. As oh, I said, brilliant. I had kind of promised myself I'd visit more of these things. Yeah, no, James, I, I didn't even know it was on to be honest with you. So it's something that was new to me. So what? Is it historical? Is it fantasy, sci-fi, or a mixture of everything? What What is there at this particular convention? Um, I get the impression that there was more fantasy and sci-fi uh, traders and sort of exhibitors than there were fantasy and sci-fi customers, weirdly. Right, okay. Uh, so you, you, feel, you feel it was more historical, say, bods there rather than... Uh, your, your sort of sci-fi and fantasy kind of uh, gamers. Yeah, I think so. Okay, uh, interesting. It, it, the, the mixture was fairly similar to Salute. Um, yep. Some of the bigger names that you get at Salute that take up a lot of space weren't there. Um, okay. Foundry had their massive stall. Yeah. Um, but I don't think there was an official Warlord or Mantic or anything like that sort of contingent. Okay. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, and there was a few smaller stalls there was an awesome little local game shop that had come and they had um, second-hand Warhammer books was one of their main things they were selling. They brought a bit of everything. They brought some Pokemon cards and random geek stuff, the sort of things yeah. they sell in their shop. But yeah, they do, you know, had... do you know what? I'm oh, sorry, Jones, to jump in there. I was going to say, I, I saw that uh, on your most latest video with the the uh, war game books i think there was like a third edition for like 115 quid or something yeah something 100, like that. 110 pound for warhammer fantasy third which isn't at the, it was in really nice nick it was in off the you know brand new off the shelf oh nick. really oh gosh and yeah okay look i haven't seen the ebay prices for those and then you obviously add an in-person sort of premium on that i don't think yep. that was an unreasonable price they had a few books and they were depending on sort of desirability so let's say uh they were sort of 30 or 40 pounds for some of the old codexes and once again oh, it's right, not nice. something that i would spend the money on particularly because i quite like hunting them down on youtube if you wanted one of these older books in good nick and they were that right there you put it in your hand yeah um, yeah I, they weren't ridiculous prices at all and there were some absolute gems in there and then yeah that's it there was another small stall that was selling uh, a whole bunch of out of print uh, minis and books. So a whole bunch of uh, older Privateer Press stuff. Actually, some current Privateer Press stuff for that matter. Some uh, Ron and Bones, I think it was called the game. Some F Freebooters Fate. Uh, some Star Warsy bits and pieces, mostly from out of print games and older stuff. Uh, but just a weird selection of stuff, and that's where I ended up buying a. Uh, Iron Kingdom's RPG supplement for like 
It was only meant to be uh, £3.25 or something. I ended up giving the guy £4 because I didn't want to mess around with change. It seemed, <laughs> it seemed ridiculous. For a book that I, only a few years ago that I was looking at spending, I can't remember, like 15, 20 quid on. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, like I say, I mean, we, we touched upon it in the last episode, didn't we, really? That's probably why it probably doesn't cost as much anymore. Uh, I think a lot of people have moved away from Privateer Press, but even yeah, you, so... You could have picked up a brand new set of the... Uh, the rules for Mark Three, and I think it was like I can't remember if it was sort of it was somewhere between six and ten pound, but it was bargainous for the thirty or forty pound you know hardback, yeah, uh, yeah, full full size rule book. Uh, oh, there was a, there was at least uh, a War Machine Prime and a uh, what's the other one? Oh, what the Hor uh, Hordes. Hordes Hordes Prime, yeah. So there was those books in there, uh, but oh, it was quite interesting. Nice. There was a couple of sort of second hand type stalls. That were quite interesting to look at. Yeah, it's probably um, sort of thing you don't actually get a salute. Um, no, sort of second hand. Well, not that I've seen anyway. Maybe maybe there is one hidden There's away in the corner somewhere. But... but there isn't. There wasn't a sort of niche one. Yeah. Would you go? Would, would you go back? Oh, for sure. I yeah. I only spent a few hours there, two or three hours, mm -hmm. and I spent most of that just chatting to a couple of rookie game designers. Yeah. Uh, which was quite interesting because I quite like that sort of thing. Sure. And so, yeah, it was quite a nice experience to be out and in the community, sort of in surrounded by all that stuff. It, do you know what? Yeah, so it's a little bit like, again, another one of the, the most re recent episodes we were talking about that, weren't we, about um, getting back into the community. And so, yeah, so do it, do it, getting to these shows is a great way of doing that, isn't it? And talking to the people who are behind the games, sometimes that's always really interesting. Um and even just generally just chit-chatting to anyone who's sort of around by the stalls and looking at certain games that you're interested in. It's always, it's always interesting. It's always a, a fun thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I said, it was, it's, it's basically just like a little mini salute. And I said, it was only the, the, just going around all the stalls and having the first glance at everything. I was, was probably about an hour or so. Didn't take right. much time. The last one, a bit I want to mention about it though, was this, there was a bring and buy section, which I thought was quite a cool idea. Which Aye. is that you? Anyone could bring something. You signed a little form. You said how much you wanted for it, uh, and then you put your contact details on there. Right. And then they put it out on the stall. Yeah. And the 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 event took ten percent, hmm. and it had such a weird mix of stuff. And I picked up some old Eldar metal, uh, what are they Red Guard. Yeah. Uh, five for a ten, which I seemed I thought which I thought was pretty reasonable. It's cheaper than I can normally see them on eBay. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, and there was a whole bunch of stuff, and it was the prices were varied, um, but they were all pretty reasonable because it was just people just offloading their old bits and pieces and spares. Yeah, um, and there was some really interesting stuff, uh, and then there was a complete mix of stuff from you know six mil World War Two straight through to forty k. Um, nice. So yeah. nice, and that was that was a really interesting, even from just a. A curiosity angle that store was quite an interesting place to visit and browse through yeah yeah you could probably just spend a bit of time there just looking at all the weird things that people brought in yeah yeah sure good stuff right then mate shall we get on with the main topic then for today the main topic i, I, I still haven't come up with a, a proper title but it's <laughs> maybe how how complex should a game be yeah i like that that's or, good yeah how important is i don't know yeah how complex should a game be? Um, yeah. I think the first thing we want to sort of define at the beginning, maybe, is what really constitutes a game. What what is a set of rules? Mm. Um, because I think there's quite a lot of variation. There is. I'd agree with that, and I think it's got more varied uh, as the hobby has grown. So I think we're probably more or less we, we want to limit ourselves to talking about miniature wargaming. That's what we do here. Yeah. Uh, so I would say the minimum requirements would be the rules to sort of um, simulate a fight between sort of movement and some sort of combat between miniatures on a tabletop. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think that's yeah. the, the the sort of minimum description. That's that. It, yeah, that that's. Is it always a fight though? Actually, is it always combat? Um, 
I can't think of an example where it's not actually. Well, uh, I mean, the, the clues in the title it's war game. It's true. That is true. So, so you're gonna have you're gonna be fighting. You're gonna be probably moving. Um, I don't know. You, you could. I think I've played one game of Frostgrave where no one shot at each other. Oh yeah. No one didn't. So, but, but then, did you still fight monsters? Hmm. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Probably did. So. So yeah, I, I think you're right. I think that that your description there that that is, that is the minimum a set of rules should offer. Uh, um, it should offer a rel- relatively comprehensive uh, form of words to tell you how to move your miniatures and how to um, you know, shoot and fight. And yeah, that, that, that should be the, mi- the minimum standard. Yeah, and I think there is certainly crossover between war games and board games. And I'm thinking things like Zombicide. So you have miniatures you've got essentially two sides you've got your survivors and your zombies and then there's rules for movement and shooting and then there's uh, space hulk as well yep uh i don't know if you'd call it a board game or a miniatures game it's it's on that sort of line isn't it yeah it's sort of a hybrid isn't it i mean both of them actually really kind of hybrids i suppose um yeah and then there's... i'd call it a, i'd call it a board game but and then there's chess yes um You've got the miniatures, you've got rules for movement, rules for combat, yeah. essentially. So, well, yeah. I mean, essentially, I mean, I suppose chess is the, it's obviously not a simple game in in its tactics, but in its rules of how the game works, it's probably one of the most simplest, isn't it? You know, each piece does an action. Yeah. Uh, and they cannot deviate from that action. So, you know, very, very simple. I go, then you go, sort of turn rules. Yeah, and instead of measuring, we've got... Um, squares. Squares, which is how yeah. also how uh, sort of Space Hulk and uh, Zombicide work as well, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, I think that can sort of be included into sort of what we're talking about. Um, okay. But yeah, so what the only thing we're going to talk about is how within those get bounds, um, is it worth you know what's the value of having a simple game versus a really complicated sort of involved game? Uh, okay, and we're going to yep. I think we'll start with what's the what's the sort of simplest games that we we've played probably, and what probably the advantages to a a simple game okay uh so so i reckon probably one of the simple games i've played is probably going to be age of sigma if i'm honest yeah now there's two a little bit like war machine and some other bits and pieces there's two sides to this there's the rules for the game and then special rules the rules for the game of age of sigma famously fit on uh, a side of a4 um, and they're incredibly straightforward. Yeah. But then, as we just described, if as long as you have a movement value, uh, a way to resolve that movement, and and then a way to do a combat, mm-hmm. that's kind of your basis there. And because the movements, you can move in any direction at any time, instead of in you know in any order sort of thing. And yeah, there's no know, restrictions. There's, there's, there's no there's restrictions no, to the movements. Yeah. So that yeah. obviously simplifies that, and then the second part of that is the is, is the special rules, which kind of yeah. make it more complicated. And mm-hmm. then I think with Age of Sigma, you can kind of add and take away from that second part as much as you want. Well, and 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 do we even include those special rules in 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 this conversation in a way? Because they have to. Because like, I think they're part of the. They are part of the game. Yeah. Think. Yeah, because then you've got games. Uh, and I'm mean, obviously overmark again, fresh in my mind, where there isn't much in the way of special rules that more or less doesn't exist. Yeah, where all of the rules are described in the rule book, and the pieces are Wait. simply, you know, I, part of that. I think, I think for me, the easiest comparison on this for myself to sort of get um, get my head around this is looking at 
it's the probably the most popular game out there 40k okay now 40k started off as a very complex game in the form of road trader extremely complex because it was it was, a, it was an rpg as much as it was a war game i mean you okay. had to do sort of genuine maths didn't you to find out God, certain things yeah the weapons. yeah God, and, and, and you know, and so you could get mutated, and you know, just biz really bizarre things would happen in that game. And you'd have a game master as well, so yeah. you, you'd quite you'd, you'd you'd quite often play with with three people, so two people playing and one as a game master. And it required and then a fair it, bit of bookkeeping, didn't it as well? Oh yes, it did. It does, and and it's a big, thick book. I mean, the 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 road trader uh, rule book is pretty much all rules. Mm -hmm. There's not much fluff in there. It's all rules. Which and then fluff sort of in between those bits and pieces. Now, then you, the iteration then goes over into second edition, which then was a bit of a hybrid um, because it, they they certainly um, streamlined the rules. Uh, they removed the more RPG element to the game, and but they but. At the same time, it was quite a complex game still to play. Um, you know, when you went, I was, I've, because I've been doing my uh, second edition army recently, uh, the Hall of Griffins, I've been obviously flicking through the rule books and, you know, silly things like your trooper can, it has only got a 90 degrees angle of fire. Okay. And that depends as well. We, he's not 360. So if once you've placed him in a position and he's facing a certain way, he only has 90, 90 degree angle then to fire at. Uh, you know, it's just silly things like that. Things that that make the game a little bit more complex. You have to think, oh, which way should I face this guy? You know, silly things like that in that game. Mm -hmm. um, so it's still it's still a complex game. But then they had to the transition into third edition, which really is the start of modern day 40k and you know in a way probably warhammer as well where they go into this more they've gone they went they go from a more of a fun sort of feel to a more dark you know very serious feel but at the same time they've gone serious but the rules were dumbed down they became much more simple um almost it, it is almost at the point when they realized ah we need to get children into this how can we do that let's make it simple yeah, Let's so make it how simple? So, so how so, simple in the scheme of things? Yeah, I would say early. This to me, that's early forty k. I never played any of the Road Trader type stuff. So they they the Games Workshop clearly saw a big advantage to making that significantly simpler. And I do remember the first few games of forty k that I played. I don't know what edition that was. Um, it was sort of when Sisters of Battle came out, when the when the Inquisitor Codex was a, was released around right about then. There was there was a um, Sisters of Battle Codex for second edition, so it could have been second edition. Oh, it wasn't the yellow one. It was the I'm thinking of the the specifically the black. So it wasn't the one with the famous picture of the girl with the no no uh, no the, it was... the, the leg up sort of thing. No, it was the it was the sorry it was the uh, the Witch Hunters the Witch Hunters book. Okay, so That's... it might have been third. Uh... Might have been third. Yeah, it was a sort of I don't know. comments. Comments down below, guys. When did the what edition did the original Witch Hunters book, the black one, uh, come out in? Mm. Um, but yeah, I remember it being a pretty simple game, and hearing from the sort of veterans grumbling that it was you know dumbed down and for children now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but Games Workshop obviously found a massive advantage to doing that. So I've, what is the advantage of doing that? So why have they gone from that? Yeah. So I've written down the obvious at the moment on my, on my little plan here, which is wider audience uh, equals more players equals more cash. Yeah, and I think that's, I agree. And I think that's one of the main tenets, probably, of simpler games. You can well, you can attract can... more players, possibly. Yeah, I mean, I remember as a kid um, playing second edition and just being completely confused and and not playing it properly but maybe if i had jumped in when i was uh i missed it say i missed second and went into third edition I, I might have had a different experience as a kid yeah because the, the rules would have been simpler 
there may may not have been any of these sort of more faffy rules to worry about. Um, I may have been able to just, you know, play a game without sort of getting just bamboozled by all these odd oddities. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. I think a simple game allows for uh, mass interaction. It allows for people to uh, fall into the hobby uh, and and sort of grasp it straight away. There's no, you know, you, there's games out there you couldn't just you couldn't play them if you're a, if you're a first time gamer. You know, a hundred percent. There's definitely I'm, there's definitely games out there that that we'll, we'll get onto that in a bit, but require yeah. a lot of like studying. I think would be part of the agreed thing and, yeah and actually say so following on what you're just saying what obviously i want to get more fantasy player my experience is more of that but mm. when i used to hang around uh in a games workshop many many moons ago i would see the kids trying to learn fantasy sort of sixth or seventh around about then and yep. as you say they would get a bunch of rules wrong just almost on purpose to try and make the game playable and we're talking yeah kids that had to sort of strain to 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 sort of peer over the tops of the high tables, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they would, yeah, they they almost self simplify the game in some ways. Um, whereas I don't think that would be required with Age of Sigma. No, I think you could probably no. sort of leave out some of the the special rules and the synergies and and some of that stuff in your armies. But I mean, I mean, you could you could surmise as to maybe that's one big reason why GW did remove um War- warhammer and replaced it with age of sigma yeah because people were just simply not getting into it because it was com- too complex you know um i mean there's many reasons why people think they did it but that it could just simply be b because people were saying to them my god this is just ex- this is just too complicated I d- i've never played this before this sort of thing before and i ha- haven't got a clue whereas you can walk into a shop and be and sh- be shown how to play Age of Sigma, and you'll walk away pretty, pretty pretty confident. You'll be able to show your mate how to play Age of Sigma. You know. Yeah, yeah. You could you could be rolling dice in Age of Sigma, and yeah, showing someone else how to do it within a within a couple of hours. I think the the base of the game. Yeah. Uh, and then you can obviously yeah, with the the fact that it's the special rules that make it even a game. Really, it uh, it means you can add that add them sort of as you go. And learn a learn a unit at a time, and I think so. That's kind of brings me to sort of e- easy to learn, hard to master. I think that's one of those things that is the the goal of probably any game design. So not just war games, board games, or card games, anything uh, easy to learn, hard to master. I mean, I I've played a game called Hive, uh, where you use a series of tiles with bugs on, and they've got sort yep. of chess like. Uh, attributes so a spider moves one way and a ladybug moves another way and the, the aim is to surround the uh the opponent's uh queen bee and right okay the rules are pretty straightforward i could teach yep. you in five ten minutes okay but the game is incredibly difficult to play against someone okay because it's which makes it quite um, engaging. And yep. you can play the same game with the same five pieces versus uh, someone else almost endlessly, I, you know, for hours. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's still engaging. I think you're, you're, you're dropping onto a point, a relatively good point here, uh, uh, and, a, and a very good advantage to a simple game. Um, with with simple rules uh, can sometimes give you a more um, what's the word stringent set of rules so they're they're harder to break so it then creates a um, in a way a more competitive game you know I mean yeah no, take I, it out take take, take 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 it out of um, war game for a second you know some some of the most simplest games in the world, for example, I don't know, you could say like tennis is 
relatively simple game in terms of the rules. You've got to hit the, the ball over the net and keep it within, within the lines. It's a simple, simple rules, but to master it is extremely difficult, extremely hard. Yeah. Um, and it, 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 I know it's out of context there, but the principles are still the same going into a, a war game that uh, providing it's, it's hit that sweet spot where it can do that. Now I Going back to a- AOS, I don't. I'm not entirely sure that is the case with AOS. No. To be fair, I'm I'm not a big player of AOS, so I, I don't. It, I, I'm you know I'm, t- I'm t- probably talking above my station. No, it, it isn't. It? It's it's not. It's 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 easy to learn, mm. but it's also hard to learn because of the 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 nature of the the special rules. Right. Um. I would say it probably is still hard to master. To be a master at anything is, is, is you know, well, yeah. quite diff- it's difficult. But you certainly couldn't play the same game with the same army twice in a row or ever, and it would still be interesting. It's not. I mean, I this is per- obviously all personal opinion, but it's not interesting the second time you play it anyway. Full stop. Um, I said, bring it slightly closer to wargaming than tennis is chess, obviously. Massively competitive game, so you're right there. Because you've got yeah. such defined rules and what you can do within them, exactly, it brings the tactics of it just up. And I mean, obviously, chess and hive are actually, oh. in some ways, quite comparable. Um, and then bringing wow. it closer, again, like into war game, another game that I think has like a genuine war game that has nailed that easy to learn, hard to master was X Wing for a while. Yeah, because you could you, fly, you could fly the same two squads against each other. And get quite different results uh, and different games. I think, yeah, depending um, on the depending on the player's ability to control them units. Yeah, and you'd have to think a few turns ahead. And I think the sim- more simple and rigid the rules are, the easier you can think ahead. So, for instance, Age of Sigma, though, one of the maybe the reasons it doesn't work as a simple game is because it's quite unpredictable. Literally right. anything can happen next turn. You might not even yeah. the you, your opponent might even have two turns while you don't have any. Um, yeah, because of the, the sort of the way it works. Right. Okay. Um, whereas X Wing, there's only a set number of maneuvers that each item can do, so it's more varied than say chess. But there's still a predictable amount of things that your opponents can do. And then obviously you're aware that your stuff's predictable, so then you are trying to think. How can I not be predictable? And then you end up in that whole uh, Princess Bride situation of, I know that you know. Yeah. I know that you know that I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, um, definitely. Definitely. And once you're into that sort of mindset, you, you, yeah, you've, you, you're in a, in an engaging game. I think, I, th- I think, I think a, um, a simple set of rules, uh, can, can really help to create a competitive um, side to the game. It definitely can definitely help. I mean, it's, it's, I'd say it's a, just because it's just because the rules are are simple doesn't mean they can't be competitive. Yeah. Um, be, because actually, by being simple means you as a player you need to find ways around them rules to to get the edge. So you you're always trying to one up yourself. On things you know you you don't have to fill your head with oh does my unit do this you, you it's simple enough to know that so you can then concentrate on your tactics and how you want to maneuver your troops with or this that and the other or any synergies that might happen within your your units um so yeah i i i i, I do feel that um a simple set can lend itself to competition play let's say yeah, and Definitely. I think, and you see that you see that with X Wing, don't you? I mean, or it used to. I mean, they used to be some fairly big competitions for X Wing. Yeah, 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 and I think yeah, you, the, the the easier because if you're going to have a competition game, so if you think of um, oh. Kings of War and War Machine as well, both big tournament games. Yeah, uh, slightly more complex than we've than we've been talking about, but they are still very bolted down rules. They're both quite, they're both relatively simple games. Once again, War Machine relies on individual special rules to make it the, complex. The, well, well, yeah, this is it. I mean, this is why I said about, do you, uh, do you take in special rules as, um, 
as part of what the rule set because you're right uh i think uh war machine's a funny one because yeah it technically it's a simple it's a very simple game you learn it very quickly but learning all the rules all the bits and pieces all your units do or all the special rules then it turns into a complex game so i don't know yeah no and but then if you think of chess on the same lines so the rules to chess are then each person takes turns to move a piece and the piece takes its move it's almost that that's almost the the game yeah the added complexity comes from you could almost call them special rules yeah exactly that's what i for mean each, so for each piece uh, so i think i i think we you do have to depending on how important those rules are to shape the game as i said with age of sigmar uh, you couldn't almost they're not all, as much to, to to add to that complexity whereas with war machine they really well, were yeah well for, for war machine they were the game weren't they the yeah. the, the complex side the the special rules were the game uh, which then puts i think personally puts a war machine into the more complex rule sets yeah yeah if yeah. we're going to talk about what games in what's so if you had two two sets simple rule sets and complex rule sets so uh, I th yeah i think war machines sort of steps that thing quite well because for the actual for movement and shooting and all of those businesses mm. after your first couple of games though you never have was... to look, you never had to look at that rule book again that those pages no. of the rule book were sort of done, done. You, you learned them yeah you'd learn them really early on yeah whereas um there's other games where you would still have to sort of look back on that there's another simple game as well it's on this on this borderline that i wanted to bring up that could be an interesting one and that's D D. okay i've played a couple of games of D D now and i don't know the rules but the stand the basic rules that a player needs to learn is a, a, a pretty straightforward yeah but that's that's again that what makes that more simpler for the player is you generally have a games master who fully understands the rules yeah and he and he talks you through it i feel that's slightly different i mean it could be but i could say it's could like it, get, it could be say does it get the sort of benefit of both worlds then anyone can play D, D. you can have a five-year-old could play a game of D D as long as they rolled the dice when they were told to yeah and, got, and yeah and, it, and got involved in the story yeah so you anyone literally has yeah. can, can play in dnd so it's got a massive wide audience it's obviously i mean it's well oh, it's a huge global it, phenomenon right it's been going on for years it, and yeah more exactly people are playing yeah. it than ever now and it's mainstream isn't it's it probably you know, mainstream it, yeah so yeah yeah that, that, you're right i mean that is a a good example i and guess it, of of a of a sim of a of, simple set of rules done done really well you know but as you say what makes it good what makes it actually playable in a game is the vast amounts of complexity available to it yeah so i mean you could kill someone with the with the right D, &D source book i mean yeah uh actually, what the iron we just mentioned earlier the iron kingdoms rpg rule set that the source book for that is is about an inch inch and a bit thick, mm. and then I've added I've got um, a few add-ons for it, the pirate add-on and the uh, I said monster Omicron Now I've got yeah. two inches of solid paper, um, to, and that I, I could I could use all that in one game. Yeah, I mean that's a lot of that's a lot of reading, but the actual rules because you've played a KRPG. The actual yeah, rules yeah, for, for combat and moving and even for character creation were all pretty simple. I mean, they yeah. they were essentially War Machine, weren't they? Um, so yeah, I think yeah. And even I've played a number of D and D games, and uh, and you know, character creation is relatively easy. I mean, sometimes you might have someone walk you through a little bit, but it's all pretty standard. I think um, there's definitely levels as well, and I think I think with D and D as well, I think. The character creation is actually quite interesting in that it becomes mm. more complex as you progress. So yeah. as your character becomes more advanced, sort of your options and character creation 
yes, can, can, that. can widen up, which is a, it's a cool... Uh, you're kind of levelling up with your character. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Because your first few level characters aren't going to require their own books, whereas I know people who've got D&D characters that literally have their own... You know, you, you start adding source books specifically mm. for your... Um, your background and your bits and pieces. Um, yeah, no, definitely. So then, yeah, so what we're actually moving on to now is the pros for a complex game. So right. we've already got War Machine. So, yeah, the, <sighs> well, the basis of it is, is done. It's out of the way. We, we've got that in our minds. But what made it a really engaging game for um, for months and months? We've played it for years. You could play the same army against each other a few times, I think. Oh, you, no, you, you can play the same army um, con continually and get different results every time. Because you, you, what, what was great about that, that game, this is second edition <laughs> for War Machine we're talking here. Um, what was good about that game is once, you, okay, you might play a game and every game you play, you learn something about the opposition's units which then you will then you'll never make that same mistake again plus you learn more about your synergy with your units which you find give you a bigger punch and you know there's it's, it, it really is quite complex with the it's all about um utilizing the stats from all your different units and amalgamizing them together yeah. uh, and having your army work as one solid unit uh but using hundreds of different rules to do that you know? yeah and that and that's where the complexity comes and yeah with that stacking game. stacking spells stacking effects yeah. stacking auras yeah um yeah B buffing buffing debuffing you know things that actually quite frankly quite there's quite a lot of um rules in that game that you don't or you, you don't see in many other games uh no, it, it, yeah, some, do you know what? Actually, some of those things, as you mentioned, like the buffing and the debuffing and the auras and things, is yeah. almost more akin to uh, computer games. It's almost yeah. akin to something more like Warcraft or like Diablo or something. Yeah, I get that. I get that. It's, it, it is, actually. Yeah, I, and I don't, I don't think I've actually ever played another game where that is a big part of the game. They brought you it know, into the late, one of the late, that, whatever the last edition of 40K I played was a few years ago. Um I think just whatever the last yeah, one is but... from now, started to really bring in uh, stackable sort of auras. Uh, okay. Whenever the okay. the new giant marines came out, right, they, the had, they had they had a variety of yeah they had a variety of stackable. And um, I fact actually okay. my Nurgle army, um, each Nurgle character had a had an aura that did something. But but never to the same degree where oh, you never. needed where you need to do it to win. I mean you now you can just probably. On the, you can just bring Primaris Marines now and just say, "Yeah, there's my Primaris Marines. I win." Yeah, I mean, you could with those. Because by the time you, you, <laughs> you bought three of the captains, whatever the different rules were, and you could yeah. just go, "Well, yeah, this aura means they're invincible, and this aura yeah. means that they kill everything that they look at." Well, we're being cynical now. <laughs> yeah, but, um, <laughs> but no, but but no, honestly, yeah, it's weird. It's, thinking about it, it's just it's it's a it's an interesting. T um, so it's that uh, complexity that made the game yeah, yeah, desirable, I think. And then we'll go to my favourite game, which is probably still, in some ways, uh, Warhammer Fantasy. Yeah. And now I played a game of 8th recently, and now I hadn't played a, a, an old Games Workshop game, I call it, count it as old, uh, for a while. And I forgot how complex a game of 8th was. I don't think, unless you played it day in day out i don't think that you would learn the exact finesse of even things like moving and combat off by heart very quickly it's yeah i mean the the movement rules you've got there's different limits to how you how you can move when you can move wheeling yeah. and and arc arcs and reforms um there's yeah. rules the com i mean the combat table, uh, weapon skill, the weapon skill to hit table. Do you remember that thing? I mean, I think yeah, yeah, a, oh, yeah. There was a similar thing in 40K there was for yeah. a while, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. That's that. Even that table. I mean, 
Some people you, learn that off by heart. If you yeah, if you think about it logically, there's a it's it is doable. But when I was younger, I used to have to have that in front of me. Yeah. I, and do the two the two finger thing. Oh, it comes to oh yeah, there you go. There's my finger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd have to look that up. And I said even the sort of yeah, movement and fighting. I mean even things. Then you've got yeah, sort of more slightly more complex things like banners. And if you steal, if you overrun a unit, you steal their banner, and then that banner can be stolen back. Um, oh, I mean, the, the game had so many iterations that it, it just grew and grew and grew, didn't it? And and unlike a lot of other games, whether whether it be by GW or, or it was kind of like a um, they sort of try to improve it each time. Oh, this is the things we found last time that didn't work. And let's belt that on. They sort of like lots of bolt-ons, I think, in that game. So by 8th, it just became unbelievably complex. But at the same um, time, it's, it's, in some ways, 8th was very... To my eyes at the time, I, I don't remember the, the details of it now, but at my eyes at the time, 7th and then 8th were both... There was definitely complaints both times about it being dumbed down. Oh, really? Yeah, mate, well... Uh, I mean, this well, maybe maybe I'm talking out of my. No, no, no. You're right. You're right. They definitely every single time they would make changes, and they they. <laughs> I sort of felt it like an old car. You know, they try and fix one thing, and then something else would break as a result. Yeah. Um, and we've yeah. talked about this before. Like, I think seventh, the, the magic was terrible and just was game changing, and then eighth was all about hordes. Now, I don't know if that was a design choice. To try and make the game more fun or if it literally was just a an excuse to sell more models i don't know but each yeah each time they would change something but they would also lose something they'd lose something yeah they'd lose something about it and and, and and is that is that why you always i mean you always go back to this sixth edition being the holy grail um because is that why maybe maybe some ways, worked because it was more pure i think yeah i think they you, they'd interfered with it less so in yeah. some ways it made more logical so sick was sense. kind of sick was kind of that sweet spot where they they'd improved on like third and fourth and fifth and and it got to this point this pinnacle of sixth and then after that they just basically started breaking it it was like it's fixed so don't fix don't you know it's good it works so don't fix it type thing but they tried to fix it and it, and then broke again going back down so it was like okay got to the mountain and go back down the mountain yeah. And I mean, maybe, maybe. things like, um, I mean, one of the things I used to love about old uh, 40k was, uh, so in the old Witch Hunters Codex that I was on about, there was a Sisters of Battle, like, uh, oh, what was she called, like a chaplain or uh, the, the leader. And you had to individually equip her. You had to choose what armor she was going to wear. Mm. Uh, you had to choose her gun. You had to choose, like, her hairstyle. I don't know. You had to choose... Mm right down to like five point items and you would have to make this sort of combo you have to think about every item you gave her and make this sort of combo up out of all these individual armory items which I mean, I, I think... i've not seen in a game i mean that there was there were similar things in slightly different codexes but i've not seen that in a game since that you could equip each character i mean until you get to something like stargrave where that's the kind of the point but that's then Virgin into RPG, and you've only got ten characters. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, with forty k, uh, as far as I'm aware, I've not, I've not played ninth edition. Is it ninth edition they're on now? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've not played ninth edition, but I, by all accounts, it's got a little a little bit more complex. I think that apparently they've brought in a few things that were were in second edition into the. Yeah into the rules again so they sort of maybe brought a few things back but i don't know yeah but i think so I'll, I'll take you back to sort of yeah so we're back in the the early 2000s and i'm in a, in a war game shop and there's some kids kind of not quite playing fantasy properly yep and everything smells of plastic glue and sweat are, are we yeah. there are we are, yeah. we, are yeah. we in the location <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> i have spent at this point a year or two Pouring over the uh, sixth edition big red book, yeah, to get to the point where I am proficient in the game, where I yep. don't have to look it up constantly. Mm -hmm. I still have to have one near me when I'm playing a game, but mm -hmm. the 
And I think that once you, and you, you could have hours and hours long rule discussions about tactics, yep. about army composition, um, all stuff like that. Actual, not just talking about models uh, like we tend to these days, more deep. And then I think we, we were a lot more invested. There wasn't any other games really. It was either that or 40k to a certain extent, or, or you know, Necromunda or. Yeah, agreed. Like agreed. So there wasn't a lot more options for us in our heads, but we were very invested in this quite complex, big game. And when they sort of brought out the new editions, we understood the rules well enough to really know what the changes were and what that meant and have these long... I mean, the internet was barely invented. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you'd be sit there, you'd, you'd be in the store talking... Uh, about how it's going to change your army, how you're going to, what you're going to do because of this particular rule, and yeah, 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 yeah. I get that, I get that. And yeah. you could talk for, I mean, the day a new codex came out or a new army book, and every, you know, the f people would buy a few copies and they'd pour over them, and that was a genuine like excitement and a and a and a buzz. And I, I think you need that level of sort of passion and dedication, and I don't think you get that from a simpler game. I think. To get that yeah, invested, that's... you have to be. If you've spent all that time learning it, you've really had to sort of throw yourself into it. Yeah, you're now invested in it, and in any changes and any. Yeah, I think that is one of the massive things about a complex game. And then you think about D and D again, and you go, the more complex that story becomes, the more complex your characters become the more yeah agreed agreed uh, immersive it becomes the more you're invested and you're involved and you want to play more and i think that's i think something like x-wing excellent game or first edition yeah. anyway that's never going to be the case there is obviously you can talk for hours about tactics there because it is you know quite tactical but not to the same sort of depth and passion i don't think as you well, you won't talk you won't games. talk yeah you won't talk about the rules you won't go oh you won't talk for hours about a particular rule that's going to change the game you know it, it probably didn't really happen uh, i think uh, another uh, pro for complex games um and i think this falls down into the historical side of things mm -hmm. i think com complex games really um uh, lend themselves to historical wargaming um because and i've seen this a lot discussed a lot on a lot of the forums and facebook stuff about uh for historical stuff uh, a more complex game can quite often give more um more of that feeling as as if you're fighting that that battle um yeah. it gives you a bit of flavor for the history a bit more because it goes a bit more in depth into what the unit actually did and how it worked so you have special rules for that particular unit and this that and the other um so it becomes Again, more of a simulation. You can get really down in the yeah, weeds. I think so. I think that's probably a good way of putting it. I think, and again, I think we've mentioned it before, but that's one of the criticisms that you tend to get from things like bolt action and black powder is that they're actually, they're, they're too simple for mm -hmm. a historical game. Don't get me wrong. I love those two games. They're great games, but. Oh yeah, bolt um, action. Top game. But, but. If you're a really, if you're a heavily invested war, um, historical war gamer, yeah, don't get me wrong. There's a lot who play bolt action, but there's also a lot who disagree with the rules. The way, but just because they might, they feel that they they lose a little bit of um, that historical flavour. Yeah. Uh, uh, rather than, um, I think it's rather than the playability. If, if you know if that makes any sense so i think i think warlord really work hard on making their games very playable very interactive but do they get the historical flavor don't know i mean i'm not i'm not i mean i play a lot of historical stuff but no i'm not really um sort of a professional historical gamer to really under, understand whether that is the case or not but i um, definitely have seen that quite a lot on a lot of these forums so that so that I reckon that would be a big pro for a complex game. Um, definitely on the historical side of things. Yeah, no, I think so. I said that, and it comes back to what we were saying a bit, a bit before, it was the immersion and the sort yeah. of... 
Yeah, sort of I think you're right. Really involved in sort of really, and I think that adds to the escapism as well. Yeah, agreed. You, you agreed. You pl you play a game of you play a beer and pretzels type game, and the main fun of the evening is probably going to be from, you know, talking crap and having a good time and having a beer. I mean, so I so think if you're going to play a game, if you're if you're going to get down in the weeds in a Napoleonic simulation where mm. ammo becomes important, yeah, the the fun of that day is certainly no one's going to appreciate a you know a funny noise that, <laughs> that someone's making. The yeah. fun of that day is going to be that simulation and those that yeah. minutia. So it's a yeah, very no, different experience. It is a very different experience, definitely. Um, it's a little, bit, you know, it's it's obviously fun, but it's also a bit more. There's a bit more of a seriousness to it, and actually, sometimes complex games can create a bit of a seriousness to them. Generally, as a rule, um, I did mention like Road Trader, and that was very unserious, but that was still a very complex game. So, mm -hmm. you know, take that with a pinch of salt. What, what I just said there, but um, uh, what is an int interesting one then, James? You're saying that. Warhammer, uh, back in the day, you'd sit there and talk about the the rules for hours and stuff. Um, now you've got a very different rank and flank game that you play in the, the form of Oathmark. Mm -hmm. Do you how do you, where do you feel that sits in this um, in the two camps? Is it a simple or is it a say, complex? I would say it's simple. I think it's Less simple than, than, than Kings of War, which obviously is a big competitor, competitor in some ways. But I think there's also something that I've not kind of thought of that kind of is involved in this, which is a big difference between the two. And that is something that's not actually rules related, but fluff. Yeah. I think one of the things that makes the historical games important and why people like getting down in those weeds in the historical games... Yeah, is obviously it's, it's not technically fluff at that point. It's history. No, but um, you could call it. It is fluff, it is fluff in a way, isn't it? Because it's 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 the it's the story behind your game. Yeah. So and, yeah, it's fluff. I call it fluff. Definitely. And that's also your complex right. because you can find out the name of every person that was physically there at the time if you are so inclined. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's right. So one of the big, huge, 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 vast differences between. Warhammer in the olden days and uh, Oathmark now is the fluff. Oathmark essentially doesn't have any. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that the old world, Warhammer, is probably one of the most richly sort of built involved uh, fantasy settings that there is. Oh yeah, easily. There's probably more pages of Warhammer novels than there is Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. Uh, I probably would agree with that. Um, I think it's probably more in-depth than Lord of the Rings, especially now. Because, you know, it's just been going for... You know, Lord of the Rings was written by one bloke, whereas this, this you know, the, the fluff in Warhammer has been going since, you know, the, the late 70s, and it's been written by numerous people yeah so so yeah oh, it's, it, easily and it's very 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 in depth and really it's only second it's only second really probably to the 40k's law mm -hmm. um but that's sci-fi so you you know you could probably discount that yeah and i i, I mean I'm, I'm struggling now i'm thinking like made of like wheel of time any big of these novels big novel series and game of thrones or what have you I mean, these, actually, are, these, actually... are, these are well-crafted fantasy worlds or even yeah, Discworld I mean, or something, but I don't think yeah. anything the 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 range yeah. of topics that that you covered in Warhammer, from sort of aristocracy to you know with the the farmer with a pointed stick, mm. they you you really I mean even just if you just read the Gortrek and Felix novels, you travel the world and I said it's it's a whole world and it's very richly realised. So you'd have a long long conversations about that made up world. Yeah, yeah. And there was still room in it to make your own uh, fluff up as well. I think I had a chaos war band that were uh, that living in in the sort of dark elf area. That was my 
sort of personal bluff at the time. And I think most people do have their own. I mean, they certainly have a, a, a general idea of their army. Yeah, I um, can't see why you wouldn't do that. Um, they come. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, then we compare that to Oathmark. Now, yes, the rules are a lot simpler. Uh, you never roll more than five dice. You have a you know, fairly close set of modifiers. The movement is almost as about as opposite as something like Age of Sigma as you could get because I actually realized I've been playing movement wrong for a little while. All right. Uh, in that you can only charge straight forward. You can't make yeah. a single turn or curve while you're charging. Right. Uh, you can use your first move to, to reposition. Yep. And then, then charge. Yep. Uh, but, yeah. So that's something I hadn't realized. So if you want to do like a double length charge, it has to be in a poker straight line. Uh, which is both simple but then hard to play. So it's an odd thing. But yeah, all of any fluff that you want has to be homemade, basically. Yeah. There's, it, there's literally... And I think that definitely takes away from the complexity of the game more than just the rules as well. That's interesting thought. That is a very interesting thought. Yeah. Um but also, but, that I mean, Oathmark's a game that doesn't have special rules, especially. You've got spe individual spells, but I'm yeah. thinking that there's a couple here and there of sort of abilities that certain things have got. But as a general game, yeah, units don't have special rules. They fit within their stat lines. So in a way, then, would you would you agree to this statement that that is, that is what... Would could make Oathmark a better competition game because there's less um, ambiguity in rules because there's like say next to no special rules uh, and the rules aren't totally complex where y you know y you'd be arguing with each other as to how they work. Yes, I would definitely say that. I think I've been to a, a an Oathmark event now, even though I think there might have only been one here. Yeah, in the UK, and I and I went to a couple of fantasy events. Um, never, never a tournament, but a sort of yeah, sure, but just sort of uh, games day type sort thing. of games day sort of type things. And you'd have at both times we you'd have a, a rules sort of arbiter and like uh, what's the word referee type people around. Now you could study Warhammer for for years and be one of these referees. Yeah, and come and look at a game and the answer would be roll off for it because it's not yeah. clear it's not obvious unlikely that's going to happen in Oathmark yeah yeah and that, and, that, and that is actually what I liked about um, uh, War Machine when we played that it was there was never there was very rare was there a time where it was unclear about how that rule worked the rules were very written very concisely French. This model does this, and this is what happens. It's very, they, they, it's covered itself in, like from the start to the finish of the writing of the, of the words. Whereas, and even know, all the overlapping special rules. I mean, that must be an absolute. That's a triumph on their part to make all of those overlapping special rules. Yeah, yeah, still well, mesh where, together. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Whereas uh, Warhammer and Forty K, especially the early editions were written by people like Rick Priestley and stuff. And they're, you know, and they're, and people like that are, are quite renowned for having very woolly rules, you know, rules like, oh, you know, if this doesn't work, then just roll off. Or, you know, there was a very, he's got a very, he's, love him, love him or hate him, he's got a very sort of um, certain way of writing rules, hasn't he? It's a very uh, beer and pretzel way of writing rules. It's a, no, this game is just a fun game. It's not. It's not meant to be competitive. Um, I and... think that could be a cop out, though, in some ways. And I've played games, less professionally written games, where that is a cop out. For yeah, for, for it may well be. Pool. Might I, well be. I think that the. I think a good game. And now this is this is very much what I want to talk about next week, um, as we cover to the tightness of games and specifically house rules. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, I think a good game should be clear. And I think and I think on the most part, Warhammer, for instance, Warhammer Fantasy was quite yep. the rules were quite tight, but because there was so much minutia, it became, you know, it got in its own way a little bit. Yeah, sure. So uh, a rule would contradict another rule, basically. You've got because you've got so many rules, you don't know which rule takes precedence. Sometimes it's bits like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I've completely lost but, where we are in the uh, the old plan here. No, well, we're um, just we're just talking about the pros of complex games. Pros of complex games. Yeah, but, um, which I think actually brings us quite neatly down to the downsides. Really, I think. Yeah, yeah, we'll go yeah, um, we'll do the downside downside of complex games, and I think we've we've already nailed a few there. Is that, um, is that one of them? Is that the, does the game work as well? The more complexity you add, the more points of failure you've got. So yeah, we said definitely. we said earlier about Warhammer; they kept trying to fix it because one thing you know, you heroes are too powerful. All right, we'll we'll, we'll nerf heroes and um, yeah. and we'll make the magic a bit better. Oh right, now magic changes the whole game. You might as well not turn up with any yeah. uh, units. Normal, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, yeah. well, units are going to be king then. Um, hordes, <laughs> hordes are going to win, and then you're like, well, the game's terrible. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I totally get that. You're right. A, a complex game, a complex game has the ability to eat itself up. That's that's the biggest downside to a, a complex game um a really good example of this i think um is probably the i think i don't think they've come up with a new rule set for it yet but um dystopian war, wars oh, have you ever played that right no oh, I, I played my i've God. watched quite a few game of uh, uh of what we used to call boats yeah uh, yeah dystopian wars and it's probably the most complex game ever written uh, none of the rules are in the right place you know <laughs> just it's one of them there's no indexes and stuff like that it's just a and it and it, and it just eats itself up it's not a fun game it, it's just it wasn't a fun game I, I i couldn't couldn't get into it um i mean that's obviously my opinion but people out there might might really enjoyed it but for me it just like i think you're saying it got in its own way you know it, it's trying to be complex for complex sake now that I think is a big problem for complex games. Don't be complex for complex sake. I don't need a complex game just because you think it's cool to have a complex game yeah. or a game that works. Okay, and I think a game like that died on its ass because it was too complex. It didn't make sense. I mean, no, watch, nothing happened. Watching two people play a, a, any war game to me is not a, not especially um, exciting. Uh, that, the sort of the few games that I could watch uh, in person at least and, and sort of be sort of invested in is, is War Machines one of them because that's yeah. quite uh, you know quite dynamic fast, quite, quite yeah, fast, fast flowing yeah Dystopian Wars oh my god <laughs> <laughs> what a boring game and even oh. when I mean half 50% even when you weren't buried in a book trying to work out what the hell's going on even the actual oh and then you i said you got the minutiae didn't you You had boarding actions and individual uh, cannons could go out of yeah, it, oh, honestly oh god honestly the worst game have you ever heard of a game so this is one i mentioned to you off, <laughs> off off air i think last week called uh the campaign for north africa okay no i haven't it's Probably it's, it's technically a war game, no miniatures yeah. though. It's so you kind of more onto the board game thing. Yeah, okay. It involves a, a sort of eight foot long map, and right. uh, I'm 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 on the uh, the board game geek sort of entry for it now. Yeah. The game is detailed to a degree like no other games come close to. Using you, if you're using the full rules, you keep track of every individual plane and pilot in the three year campaign. Each counter on the board representing a ground unit is composed of many units which are all kept off track of by logs. Uh, and so the supplies have... are kept track of and dispersed in a very detailed manner. Basically, you are uh, 
playing the North Africa campaign from World War Two to the it, to the level you would have had to have done to, if to you actually were it, yeah. actually Rommel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you you could yeah. by the time you've learnt that game, you could plan an army. And I've seen uh, sort of videos about it and sort of bits and pieces about it. You have to have reams of paperwork, and you have to you have to do admin, and there's sort of pages and pages of tokens and yeah. i said the map's bigger than uh than you'd have in a war game and that's only part yeah. of it and it's yeah, yeah. just and, and and so yeah back to what we said it's historical it tries to take in every single detail from the actual event just uh just give me a game of uh bow action please i'll play that there we go because <laughs> i have heard a rumor that no one's ever completed a game <laughs> No, I, do you know what? I'm not surprised. If you've if, and, and down in the comments, guys, if you've ever finished a game of the campaign for North Africa, <laughs> let us know how it went and how many years it took. <laughs> probably took as long as it did back then. <laughs> it probably took the full three years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, no. So so yeah. So so complex games. They have a a a big issue of eating themselves up. That's that's probably the bit the number one. Um, so that, downsides and to, i think that comes down to, to a, a badly designed complex game as well that would eat yeah stuff like that yeah i think so i think so also i think um again we've touched it on about competitive I, I do feel that a really complex game can suffer if it's not done if it's not written solidly oh yeah uh, as, as, as a as a competitive proof. game uh because all it does is it causes arguments because this rule says this and that rule says that and it starts becoming very hard to have a serious competitive game if that's the way you like to play. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah. another reason why, uh, for instance, Warhammer Fantasy made made a terrible competitive game, um, and due to complexity, and that is the time it took to play a game. So yeah. I was at that Oathmark yeah. event. We got three games in, in sort of I don't know. I can't remember how long we were there from sort of 10 in the morning uh till six at night eight hours and we managed to get three games in yeah that's, uh, i that's pretty... have played a single game of warhammer fantasy for eight hours mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah no that 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 and that says it all you that says it all from from meeting your mate at lunchtime getting it all set out to uh kebab time ordering chinese at 10 o'clock at night you could play the same I... game do you know what, right? And I think that's we, that's a pro that we missed on simple games is the time it takes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Actually, so, so we we missed that. We totally missed that because you know it works the opposite way around. For a simple game or simple set of rules, you can bash how, a number of games out quickly in the time that you would play, like say Warhammer. Um, so yeah, no, I totally get that. If you're playing an X Wing or a Blood Bowl tournament. So we've not mentioned Blood Bowl at all this episode, and maybe we should. It's got obviously because we were almost back into that board game territory, a very closely defined set of uh, rules. All the special rules are built into the base game, um, and yeah, you can knock out a game of a good game of Blood Bowl in a couple of hours. Um, yeah, and, yeah, probably, and you don't really have to is... consult the rule book. No, if you if you're good if you're two good players, you know the relatively know the rules relatively well. You probably play it quicker than a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah, possibly. And the only rules you really have to learn are the individual uh, abilities, like like boneheaded and fury or frenzy or whatever it's called. And mm -hmm. I haven't learned them. I, the only one I remember is horns, which is what uh, beastmen have, uh, which is gives them plus one strength when they blitz. All right, but okay. Once you've and you only have to really learn the ones for your team. Um, and as long, as long as you're playing against someone else who uh, is, is fairly friendly, yeah, uh, it, it helps if you know them all. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, so if you're playing that in a competitive setting, you could have a day of Blood Bowl. Uh, I think the most I've ever played in one day is four games of Blood Bowl. But okay. I think you and that and that makes for a fairly interesting like day tournament. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you well, can. Same, oh, same with back, X Wing. Um, well, going back to going back to War Machine when we did the competitions there, I think you got in at least four, maybe five games in. That's true, actually, because actually War Machine was. Do you remember it was timed? 
Yeah. yeah it's like you like chess. So you move your move your piece and then you press the timer. Yeah. And the only reason that that's possible is because you didn't have to have your nose in a rule book. Yeah. Um Yeah. No, definitely. Uh, right, so we, we are going a little bit off here. So another uh, another um So we're doing we're doing down on... what well, we're doing downsides are complicated. At the moment, uh, yeah. So So yeah, we, so, so... so rules so we've already done rules that intersect with each other badly game eats itself to pieces and you don't know what you're doing yeah uh the time it takes to play and the investment i think yeah, also the that's, think, that's a good one i we, think the investment think... yeah the second part of the investment is monetary oh i hadn't thought of that i was going to say that it's you have to you're not going to play multiple games like currently i'm working on oathmark and stargrave just just for the two but yep Back when we used to play every week, we used to work on a handful of games at any one time and play different stuff. Back in the day, the only reason why you could be so dedicated to uh, Warhammer Fantasy is because that's all I played. Or maybe I played a bit of 40k here and there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, he, could, he doesn't give you the opportunity to um, game hop. No. You have to, to, to be good at a complex game, you need to be playing that game. Yeah, this needs to be the only game you really read play yeah i yeah. get that Def I'd, I'd agree with that and I'd even when i that. used to play and then there was a there was a, a year or two of my life where i used to play a game of 40k and a game of fantasy every week and even just trying to keep both those rule sets in my head at the same time was a massive challenge yeah even yeah. though i played well, both every week yeah uh -huh. no it would be it would be uh, so yeah I, I definitely get that it's the it it, it definitely um yeah, it, it it stops you from experiencing other games. Yeah, yeah, agreed, agreed. And I imagine if you're um, trying to play the campaign for North Africa, <laughs> yeah, that's the only thing you're doing for the rest of your life, my friend. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, that's something sort of that massive investment in time and energy into one oh. thing but they know you're right the second thing you said was monetary as well. Which is... I did, I did. Now it's, uh, it could be controversial this one. To be fair. Because obviously, monetary um, uh, cons will hit any of the war, any 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 of the two brackets, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I I think in a more complex game, you do tend to have more units, more pieces. Yeah, you can more have pieces, more moving bits. Yeah, uh, which then obviously translates into more money. Yeah. Um, more rules, more books to re buy. Books, yeah. You know, you need to buy codex. You need to buy this extra supplement because now, guess what? You know, it's just got more complex. Do you know what I mean? It's just that's so. There's mm -hmm. there is that there is that. Whereas a simple game tends to you know have one set of rules. Well, guess you know a little bit like Oathmark. Okay, has got some supplements to it, but you can just play the Vanilla. main rule set. Yeah. And and you wouldn't have to have to have to go away from that, whereas you can't really do that for say, forty k or or fantasy. Oh, at the very um, minimum, you need an army book each. Yeah, exactly, exactly that. So, so yeah, monetary is a real, very real thing, and I think complex games it hits. I'm not saying it doesn't hit a simple game because obviously it does, but I think it hits it a little bit harder on a complex. What what are your thoughts on that, mate? I think you're right. I think the more complex... I mean, I mean uh, I've recently been looking at Saga, and Saga is quite a complex game. It's quite a... You have a fairly low mini count, but yeah. the the way that the activations and the, the, the dice system for doing weird activations works, I would say puts it firmly in the brackets of a complex game. Uh, it's Certainly, I haven't got my head around it yet. And I've read a lot of rule books. Sure. But, and one of the things that makes it complex is the components. So to get into Saga, you need the Saga rules, which is a relatively thin little book. Uh, which, So at the very basis, it's it's a simple-ish game. Yep. But you then need the your setting book. So Age of Magic is the one I've got. Uh, they've just brought out one that I'm kind of almost interested in for historical gaming, by the way. Which... Wow, Jesus! Careful, James. It's, we we've been talking about historicals too much on here, haven't we? <laughs> well, it's the they've released in the invasions book, so that covers 
uh, the Fall of Rome. Okay. So it's got all the good stuff. It's got uh, Celts and uh, Germanic yeah. tribes. Uh, yeah, Sa- yeah. Saxons. So yeah, so invasions of uh, of Europe by various barbaric um, peoples. Uh, yeah. It's got late Romans in there as well because obviously you need someone to kill, be invaded. Um, yeah. So yeah, but yeah, you need your setting book, and then with your setting book, you need, then need specifically iconed dice. Really, I mean, you could play it with d6s, I guess, but. <sighs> I, I don't, think, you, I don't you, think that'd be practical. I think it's no. actually, it would be better, better. So then you need the specific dice. And then for Age of Magic, you also need magic dice. And you'd probably be better off getting the cards. Jesus, yeah. So, so, so straight you, away. Yeah. yeah. By the time you've got yeah, these you're, components you're, required to play, you've A, got a way more complex game, and B, then it's cost you 100 quid to before you even bought a model. Yeah, you're racking it, racking it up, aren't you? You're racking the cost up. Big um, time. So yeah, no, I, I, yeah. The more pieces, the uh, the more complex. Whereas, I think, say, you take that completely the opposite direction, and you say one of the simplest games actually that I've ever played as well is Frostgrave. Yes, you can make that more complex. I mean, there's a lot of spells so actually putting your spell list together initially is fairly uh, in, intense. But once that's done, your second game is is going to be really simple. Uh, combat simple, and you only ever need ten models. You could. Yeah, to, to play the game, you would only need that sort of thing. So the book, yeah, definitely. So you buy a rule book, you buy, you split a, a, a box of soldiers, yeah, um, and you've and you've got a game that will keep you occupied for hours and hours and hours. But, well, that brings us that actually brings us to a um, to simple rules cons. Simple rules cons, and I think yeah. my big example for that I, we've touched upon it very briefly was Kings of War. I'd say Kings of War is a fairly simple set of rules. There's not a lot in yeah, the way special rules. I would agree, yeah. Uh, the movement's pretty straightforward. I mean, I think you could probably fit the Kings of War actual rules on two or three sides of A4 at most. And I think yeah. that, that ends with a game that, that works fine for tournaments, but I felt that it was very shallow. And I've played a fair bit of it. Sure. And I felt that it you, it felt you shallow mean... quickly. It didn't... There wasn't... So... So it, 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 sorry, James, I'm jumping in, but it, it lacked, um, well, shall I say, it lacked a bit of depth, uh, a bit of feel, a feel to the game. Is that what you feel? Like, that yeah. There yeah. wasn't any. And I think there was, there was limits, nothing in it that got you. There was limits to what you could do tactically, I think. Yeah. Um, there was no. Because everyone has access to the same spells and none of them were like amazing. That didn't change mm-hmm. much. It was very predictable. I think you could, you could line two armies up and you could math summary out um without really playing the game yeah it was very predictable and yeah i i, I no i get that i did I, my, I, 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 I i was i was really into kings of war to start with because it was a good alternative to fantasy and i enjoyed the fact it was a lot simpler initially but once i'd learned the game i became bored basically yeah no i, I can get that I mean, another sort of uh, con. I think we, we we touched it last week's episode where um, uh, uh, independent companies are coming out with a lot of games nowadays, and a lot of them are sort of skirmish games, mm-hmm. and they're relatively sim relatively simple rule sets to play a quick skirmish game. And the problem with that is they can be a bit of a throwaway game. So I spoke to two budding game designers on Sunday who had yeah. very interesting miniatures. Yeah. Uh, they both designed their own whole worlds, basically. One one guy had gone into the fluff really deeply. He was really okay. he actually told me it was actually quite interesting, slightly off topic, but he said that the initial fluff was invented by him and his brother walking home from school when they were little kids. Yeah. And this guy's now that. in his thirties or whatever, and he's developed this fluff over decades and it was really like you could tell yeah uh, yes. but his, fair, fair play. his game was fairly straightforward and it was just another sci-fi skirmish game yeah and, and that's the problem yeah i don't think you're ever going to get those dedicated crowds because i don't think there's enough con- oh, what's the word 
enough to, enough to get your teeth into. Sure. It's it's a hard one, isn't it? And again, this comes to a little again a little bit like we were, what we were saying last week. Um, a, a simple game is is nice uh, uh, for getting new people into a game because it's simple to play. But if you the people the problem that, that that someone like that has is that no one finds them. You know, you just don't find you. you if you're going to play a simple game, you're going to play AOS because that is what the marketing will tells you to play and I, and I played aos regularly for a whole year and it is shallow it is kiddie pool shallow mm. you can do some amazing combos and game it and be a you know whack player and but the game to play on a friday night you know out it's shallow and it's boring yeah and i think yeah that's with the West one. If you, you make things too simple, there's just nothing to keep you invested, which I think is back to the game design. It's all about quality of game design again, I think, which I hadn't really thought of when we started this conversation. Because once again, you've got Blood Bowl, which I can play for hours. Simple. Yeah. Uh, hive, chess. You know, these things complicate, uh, simple, but engaging. I think it's too easy for a simple game with simple game design to become um boring sure and, yeah and not engaged and zombie side's another good one absolutely love drum, drink, playing a game of zombie side when i've got a beer in my hand is it engaging not especially no no exactly we, we will you be jumping up to play that game again no probably will not. you join a zombie side <laughs> forum to discuss tactics yeah no, no, you you won't well someone might do but <laughs> i said i'm gonna be out there I certainly won't. Apologies uh, to you're... the officials on the side forum. <laughs> yeah, we we don't mean to smack on you there. It's a bit, a bit unfair. But no, I get that. I mean, a, a simple game has its place and it has... A, 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 but I think simple games can... They shine with the special rules and stuff that can be added into them. That's where a simple game really comes into its own. Um, otherwise, if it's just a simple game, you it's, it ends up being boring. Yeah. Uh, and that and that is no good for anyone. You know, and no think, one wants to play a boring game. And I think we're right back to game design and that like, thing, easy to learn, hard to master it being, being the goal. I think that would be... A game that gets out of the way of itself, so you can enjoy the game, but then Correct. has enough. But but then but again, again, this is what I was saying to... at the start. This is what I was saying at the start. Can you really? Um, you know, do you take an account? You don't. A simple game. You don't need to take into account the special rules because they're kind of like bolt ons. What what needs to happen is the core set of rules of how you move a miniature, how you shoot that miniature. And how you run away, or you know, that miniature should be that they're that they should be fixed, easy to learn, mm -hmm. uh, with no discrepancies that can be you know, cause arguments. That is a good sign of a simple, a good simple game. If they can do all that, then you layer it with your special rules. I think, and that's when, and that's when it becomes a, a great game. I think I think though then it's 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 how many layers you do so you can have yeah general movement and then you can layer on things like as you said running away so what's the downsides to running away you have to layer on maybe like psychology rules as they used to call them in Warhammer but you know they call different things in different games yeah um break tests that sort of thing layer that in mm -hmm. damage to big monsters does your dragon get less effective does your tank get less effective the more damage it takes things yeah. like that i think you really can layer this stuff on and it be valuable but still but does that, be but does that turn a does that turn a simple game into a complex game i think to have all those layers i think that becomes a complex game and i think that's and, and, worthwhile and then and then so this is my point that uh with think with a, with a game like war machine i would still i'd put war machine into the complex pile 
Oh, definitely. Al- albeit, because... albeit that the core rules are very simple. They're not, though, because you also, if you forget things like you could headlock, you could weapon you'd, lock, you could. That's not a core rule. It was. The core... No, it wasn't. That, that, was... Was more, that was more of a special. Uh, it's like an ability to, that you could do. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Even the system for the, the, the focus system was a fairly intense system. Built into the game. So I yeah, think, oh, I don't know. I think I think War Machine is on the the complex pile, and I think it deserves to be. And I think it was an example of a a complex game that did get out of the way of itself, did manage yeah, to make I... its rules synergize with themselves, was fairly easy to learn, and was incredibly hard to master because uh, I got absolutely whooped at the one tournament I went to, just unbelievably <laughs> so. And it wasn't because I didn't understand the rules; it was because I wasn't very good at it. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. So we we so, are in agreement that it is a, it, it, that that is a complex game. So the last, yeah, I'm just trying. Point. To, I'm just trying to get my head around what what we are classing as a complex game because, like I say, or or a simple game because if if your core cool rules are in there, but then you layer it up. As soon as you layer it up, that that then that is that hmm. is that then a complex game. So uh, so you could say no simple games are good because but, but chess, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah, I, 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 just, just to see what I'm saying. Yeah, it, it, it does. Does it? What so my point is, a game needs to be simple at its core, and then layered from there, and then it can potentially progress into a complex game. Whereas I think something like fantasy was probably never simple at its core. No, I mean, I when I had to so, learn, I had to relearn so, Eighth Edition recently. The yeah, book, so, the book's impenetrable, and this is to someone who played the game for twenty years to to relearn fantasy, just to open that first page and go, right, movement, Christ, <laughs> the movement yeah, page is three pages long. Yeah, exactly. So this is, and this is that. It's kind of, it's kind of what I'm trying to get at here, mm. um, as to how we're defining what's a simple, what's a good simple game, and what's a good complex game um if that I makes think... sense because i think because we can we can we can we can be we're slowly we could fall down the route of say sounding like we're saying that a simple game is always going to be rubbish because it doesn't have these layers so you but know that's i think not necessarily the case so i think uh we've come up with a couple of good simple games which would be like frostgrave and blood bowl i think still think blood bowl becomes a simple game the the, the rules to learn it are are only a few pages long. There's limited things you can do, but it's a very good game. Yeah. Frostgrave, once again, straightforward uh, rules for, for, for actually playing it. Gets out of itself, gets out of its way fairly quickly. Um, you can t- you can teach Frostgrave to, to little children and they, and they understand what's going on and can play. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the downside with those, I think... I mean, I know Blood Bowl is a lot of people's main game, but Frostgrave, for instance, is a good simple game. But I still don't think—I don't think any, no matter how good a simple game can be, I don't think without enough meat, it is a satisfying game. I don't know. It is, but in the short term, I do. Oh, this was a terrible topic. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk about this. For, we could talk about this for hours. We could talk about this for Wait. hours. Oh, we can go around in circles big time yeah. with this. So, so why would so you the, make... So let's finish with, why would you yeah. make a simple game? And why yeah. would you make it a complex game? And I think, why would you make a simple game these days? I think I would say money. You would it, you would do it to make something that was casual fun that you can inv- get a lot of people involved in. And the more people that you could attract, the more money you'll make. I think I can't imagine that whoever makes Campaign for North Africa sells a lot of copies. That's a very niche market. It's the most complicated game. It is going to be an incredibly niche market. Old fantasy suffered from being very specific to male metalheads. <laughs> yeah, you know oh, there was this. Time. Yeah, yeah, it was. A, there was a niche, and that's probably why they got rid of it because they're like, well, "Hang on a minute, it, we're, it we're missing a, a very market. specific yeah. set of people because yeah. of the nature of the the way the game was put together." And I think yeah. the, my fear is that more modern games are verging towards now. I, this was my fear when I wrote this plan, 
this episode plan. But having spoken to some of these game designers that are at the moment, I think we're probably verging back towards complicated, which is good. I think the, the hobby in general has become mainstream enough that people are experimenting again with more complicated things. But my fear was, and still kind of is, are games just going to become more simple so you can sell them to more people? And are you going to dilute something that we used to have back in the day? Or am I just looking at back in the day through roast tents to vectacles and actually I'm gatekeeping what could be more people's hobby by saying that I want yeah. to have to read a inch thick book? Yeah, that's interesting. That, yeah, so that's, that's, my, that's... that's my final question is, are games becoming too simple to be invested to be had to have the passion anymore which was that my the end of my question i think of episode one as well uh, yeah. and i think that is oh no i did think that was the case but then i spoke to some game designers and i think <laughs> uh, i don't know anymore uh, it's, I, it's... I think there should still be a place and i don't think i've marked it i still wish there was a place a, a game that was mainstream enough that a lot of people were still playing it nowadays, but that had the complexity of, of olden times. Or, I mean... But is that because I'm, I'm a grumpy old man? Possibly. Who misses the olden days. Possibly. I mean, I mean, the world is changing, and obviously games change with it. Um, the ga Games change a lot with things like they follow the, follow the trend, um, like GW changing the way they do things, and so... so Gamers change the way that, you know, uh, other companies do as well. They're sort of following the curve because that's where obviously the money is. Mm -hmm. um, is. Is it... I don't think it's necessarily bad to have simple games out there. I mean, because it, like say, it stops those gatekeepers because people like you will say, no, I need, I need a complex game and you can't play this because of this, 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 this. I'm not saying that you do that. I'm just being yeah. facetious. But There's um, plenty of people that I hang around with uh, back in the day that would still say that and yeah would be very exactly of the opinion that if you can't cope with playing a in-depth napoleonic game with supply chains and, and individual yeah. powder uh, loads yeah. that uh what you even do in playing a war game yeah exactly Noob. exactly <laughs> so yeah no totally totally uh, and but... you've already meant yes you mentioned them already the people who look down on black powder and bolt yeah. action yeah exactly Exactly. But those simple games are there to... Now, I would Black Powder and, and Bolt Action as as relatively simple games, okay? Mm -hmm. But they're fantastic mm -hmm. games. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would... Yeah, maybe middle middle ground, maybe middle ground. But I'd still edge it on towards the side of simple. Mm -hmm. um, because there's not loads of rules to really remember in them games. And... Now... But they're fantastic games, mm -hmm. especially Bolt Action. It's, it's a great game, and uh, that that translates over to um, Warlords of Error One as well. Mm -hmm. It's very basically I wish, the I same. I wish that was doing better, but I don't think that's really ever going to be probably a thing. not. But even so, they they're nice entry level games into that world. So into the historical world, Bolt Action is a fantastic game to get you into historical gaming mm. yeah and if you really want to get into it even more go find those slightly more obscure crazy games uh, more, more complex games definitely but it, it brings in the audience and i think we're all or do really well with that mm -hmm. um and again i think that's what aos was obviously designed to do was to bring those youngsters in to get them into the hobby get them buying new stuff um, whether AOS is a good game, it's a different matter altogether. But that certainly gets people playing, do. and it certainly gets people buying stuff. Mm. So. Yeah, and, and so so yeah. I mean, but don't get me wrong. I I am in agreement that, that in that maybe it's nostalgic as well, uh, but there just isn't anything out there like Warhammer Fantasy at the moment. There just isn't. And I think I mean, it just was a fantastic game. Whether you liked. Whether you moaned about the rules or you loved the rules, it, it, the, the, everything about the game, the, the history, the, the, the miniatures, the, the look on the table, there's just something about that game that really worked. And there's just, you're right, there's nothing out there at the moment that is doing that. 
Yeah. Oathmark, yeah, it's try, it's trying, or it tried, but just the because it's a, a Oathmark needs to off. hire. I, I think I know it's not. So I was actually going to mention Joe Games. So Oathmark, Frostgrave, Stargrave. Joe is a master of. Uh, this is Joe McCullough. For people who don't know, is a master of writing a accessible game. And there's so much buzz about all his games at the moment. I mean, Frostgrave was 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 a phenomenon. He's yeah. What one author is is making just such a big chunk of the sort of indie smaller games market at the moment, as far as I can see. Yeah. And because his games are simple and easy to grasp, I think is part of the reason. And I think, in a way, I found Frostgrave too simple, uh, but it was still a very very good game, uh, and I'm enjoying. Stargrave from what I've played of it so far. Now I'm starting to wonder as if how important the fluff is because all of those games would be better with more fluff, I think. If Oathmark had a deep lore, I think I'd like it more. Yeah. How important yeah, is that? I think so. It, it, well, maybe that's another topic. Maybe that's another topic. I think we're done, though. I think we are. I think we did that. So, James, I think that really... Brings us to a uh, recommendation of the week. I think it does. Um, I have not been buying a lot of stuff recently um, for various reasons, mostly because I have all of the things. And You do. I, I, I concur there. I, <laughs> I can vouch for that. You do have everything. Um, so I struggled for a recommendation uh, this week, something that would be interesting enough that anyone that was listening to this wouldn't already be aware of. So things like North Star and Warlord are going to be my recommendations of every week. In the scheme of things, relatively big companies uh, making some fantastic miniatures. Uh, but I did want to pick something a little bit more uh, niche. So I have been working on a Death Bard recently uh, from Heresy. Uh, Heresy Miniatures. Uh, Obviously, link will be in the description. Most of the models on the website are sculpted by one guy whose name I cannot remember off the top of my head. I think he makes some absolutely stunning... I was uh, possibly not old school, certainly not old hammer, but models look straight out of 2004. My sort of peak sort of time for, for warhammer type stuff. Uh, oh. Some of the miniatures he sells are actually uh, designed by old Cit Cit Citadel designers. Uh, he has a small range, I think they're called uh, the Spyglass range, uh, that was sculpted by oh, was it Steve Buddle uh, before he moved to Games Workshop. So there's sort of a reason for some of that style. Yeah. Uh, but some of the stuff he makes, he's got fantasy stuff, he's got sci-fi stuff. He kind of specialises in monsters. Uh, I said, currently I'm working on a, a large-scale skeleton uh, because he's kind of working towards maybe getting some plastic skeletons made. So he is making three up size skeletons at the moment in all sorts of interesting sort of poses and outfits. And they are stunning. They are absolutely stunning. Nice. Nice. And yeah, this sort of, uh, if you see him, at, uh, see the sort of heresy stall at Salute, definitely go and check out. I mean, there's a giant that's absolutely amazing. There's a dragon. If you've got 300 quid to kicking around, you don't need... <laughs> Does he have a website or anything like that? Yep, yeah, heresyminiatures.com. I said the uh, link will be in the description. Yep. Um, it's not the vast biggest range in the world, but there's some just really solidly good sculpts out there. It's, it sounds sounds like a perfect place to go for um, if you want to flesh out your Oathmark army with a monster or oh, have sure. a, get, get, yeah, that sort of thing. Or, yeah. or buy a Stargrave crew. Um, yeah, 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 yeah definitely yeah yeah it sounds 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 awesome sounds awesome yeah so uh guys please head over there check it out let us know what what you think about the miniatures it's always nice to see what you think about our recommendations are you know are they things that you um enjoy yourselves um but uh i believe really with that we come to the end of the show uh james thank you very much for having us today yeah and um good chat Good yeah, chat, mate. Good chat. Uh, and yeah, everyone, your thoughts on the whole topics and the recommendation and everything down in the comments, like Johnny said. Yeah. Remember to subscribe. Tell someone about this. That do us a favour. <laughs> yeah, it will uh, do. It helps. Give it a share. It always helps. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, it was good to have this chat. And I'll, uh, I'll 
for the next week. Yeah, see you later, guys. Bye. See you in the next one. Bye-bye.